Hello, this is Rick Harnish. I'm the executive director with the High Speed Rail Alliance. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day today to learn about Cascadia High Speed Rail. Uh, for those who are new to the High Speed Rail Alliance, we're a member supported organization um, working to educate folks around the country about uh, why we should do high speed rail, how we might do high speed rail, um, and what steps you as an individual can take to educate um, your leaders, whether they be in state capitals or in Washington, DC. Um, so we believe in what we call the um, integrated network approach, where it starts with a large master plan that includes uh, both new high-speed lines, probably about 80% of the, I'm sorry, 20% of the network, new high-speed lines, um, about 80% uh, rebuilding existing to either run faster freight and passenger uh, together, or in some cases, regional lines like the Northeast Corridor, where it's primarily for passenger, um, but using existing infrastructure. Uh, but we need a, a national plan to do this. We've taken some small steps as a country to get towards that national plan, and we need state plans and regional plans um, in order to piece it all together. Uh, one of the most exciting projects that is happening today is, in fact, the Cascadia Ultra High Speed Ground Transportation Program. Um, and so I would like to introduce Chris Ott, our Deputy Director up in Madison, Wisconsin, to introduce the speakers. Thanks, Rick, and hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, there is you know, just so much interest and hope for new transportation projects around the country and a lot of interest in those that are actually beginning to move ahead. And uh, we've been really excited about this emerging Cascadia project. So over the summer, we started asking around for potential speakers, and that led us to our presenters today. Our, our speakers will be the Washington Department of Transportation's head for the project, Jason Beloso, the strategic, or strategic planning manager with WashDOT's Rail, Freight, and Ports Division, as well as Adam Lewin, the division's transportation planner. And if you have questions, uh, or if you have comments rather, please use the chat feature in Zoom. And if you have questions, please use the Q&A. It helps to separate them out like that. And we'll get to as many of the questions as we can. And with that, uh, let me turn things over to Jason and Adam. Uh, good morning, everyone. And Rick and Chris, thank you very much for having us here today. Um, my name is Jason Beloso, as Chris mentioned, and I've been leading the agency's work on our ultra high speed ground transportation project. And um, I took the liberty of borrowing the alliances map uh, to include in our uh, front page, just to orient everyone uh, where this project is located um, in the country. So our project is unique in the sense that we, uh, we span two states and two countries, Oregon, uh, Washington, as well as going into the province of BC. Um, our presentation here today is intended to be a conversation so if there's any questions that come up as we um, click through our slides, please go ahead and do so. Chris is gonna be uh, helping us out and monitoring the chat function as well as hands raised. Um, Adam will go through the first set of slides. We will be covering uh, work to date, where this project is at right now, and the next few steps that we'll be covering in the upcoming months. So with that, I am gonna kick it over to Adam Lewin. Alrighty, uh, good morning everybody, or good afternoon for those of you who are in different parts of the country and from what I see in the chat world. Um, I'm Adam Lewin, I suppose I'm uh, essentially Jason's number two on ultra high speed ground transportation here at WashDOT's Rail Freight and Ports Division. Um, so as Jason said, I'm gonna give a very quick rundown of the work that's been done so far. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what ultra high-speed ground transportation is and how we think about this program. Uh, and then I'm gonna hand it off to Jason to talk about some you know, recent developments over the last year and what we see as our next steps moving forward. Uh, Jason, can you take us to the next slide? Yes, one sec. 
as I was saying, uh, the work that's been done so far. So uh, this ultra high speed grand transportation project has been going on for about five years. And in that time, there have been three studies. The studies have been led by WashDOT, but with um, very close collaboration and financial support from our partners at the Oregon Department of Transportation, ODOT, uh, from British Columbia, and from Microsoft. So uh, I'm gonna run through each of the studies very briefly. Uh, the first study was the 2017-2018 feasibility study. And that initial effort was uh, a really high level look at basically checking out, does the math pencil out here? Is ultra high speed ground transportation a realistic option for this Cascadia corridor? Uh, and that study found that maybe, Maybe yes, this could be a real option and it's worth looking into seriously. The next step was the 2019 business case analysis. And that uh, added a little bit of more detail, but that study was intended to assess what are the potential benefits that could accrue to the region were we to move ahead with this program. And that study found that there is the potential here for enormous uh, economic, environmental and other social benefits. Uh, finally, in 2020, the third study was the Framework for the Future Report, and that effort uh, was intended to basically tell us how do we get there from here? Um, how do we get from this being a concept into being a real program? Uh, so in kind of in sum, what we've, the work we've done so far has found that Ultra high speed ground transportation could be a real option and it's worth looking into seriously. Uh, it has the potential for enormous benefits. And while it's a really big lift, we believe there is a real path forward uh, to make this a reality. So uh, what is ultra high speed ground transportation? What is this thing uh, that these studies have envisioned and that we've been working on? Uh, ultra high speed ground transportation would be a, a new system that links the metropolitan areas of Vancouver, BC, uh, Seattle, and Portland, Oregon at speeds of as high as 250 miles an hour. Uh, we are very early in this program, and so there's a lot that we don't know, but we can say that this would likely be a separate dedicated track. Um, we can say that at least for this initial phase, it would likely run north south, but we don't have an alignment. We don't have station locations. We don't have a number of stations uh, and we haven't officially determined the technology that this system will use. Um, the point of this slide, what I'd like to draw your attention to is the graphic on the right. So I've kind of talked a little bit about what the what, the what of ultra high speed ground transportation. I want to also talk about the why. Uh, so 250 miles an hour is a nice round number, but the point of that and the reason that we're working on this is what that means for travel times. Uh, the goal of this program is to reduce the travel time between the metropolitan areas down to one hour for each segment. And we believe that that would have um, provided that the system is connected to the other existing and future transportation networks. We believe that that travel time reduction would have profound impacts on the region. And when we talk about this work, we talk about it as being more than just a transportation project. Uh, the reason for that is, you know, if a person can get on a train in Vancouver and get off in Seattle an hour later, it doesn't just change how people move around the region. It has big impacts on where they can live and work. It changes where they can study and shop and play, um, and it changes the people that they know and how often they get to see them. So when we talk about this project, we talk about it as being more than a transportation project because there are big implications um, for economic and social and cultural impacts. Hey, Adam. Um, yeah. Before you move on, can I add a few points? Um, Please do. I want to emphasize a, a couple of things here. When Adam said that um, 
you know, we haven't landed on a technology yet. At this point, um, one of the reasons why we're calling it ultra high speed ground transportation and not ultra high speed rail is that we are pretty much technology agnostic. Again, we're very early in the preliminary planning stages. So the technologies that we have been entertaining include your conventional high speed rail, Shinkansen bullet, bullet train type systems, um, as well as maglev, as well as hyperloop. So at this point, we are technology agnostic. We will probably need to narrow uh, the technology down um, as we move through our project initiation, project development stages. The other thing I'd like to emphasize and the importance of this, and this is only going to work if we have really concrete, good multimodal connections. The importance of our existing transportation systems, particularly our inner city passenger rail system, we need to have that. This does not replace the transportation systems that we currently have. So I just wanted to make a fine point uh, with those few remarks. Go ahead, Adam. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for underlining that. Those are those are both really key points. Uh, so this program, like we've been saying, has the potential for really big impacts. And it's because of the scale and the breadth of those impacts that the early planning that we are working on now is so important. Um, you know, the, the bottom line is that a program like this can't be successful unless the benefits and the costs are shared fairly uh, between all of the communities up and down the corridor. That means from the outset and frankly throughout this work, we need to have a really strong focus on equity, on thinking about the implications for land use and what that means for communities, and on including stakeholders, you know, stakeholders that include local governments, indigenous communities, uh, NPOs, all the way up and down the corridor, including those groups in the decision making. Um, there are going to be some really challenging trade offs. Uh, there's a lot of factors that will need to be balanced. Those include speed, financial viability, equity, and the early decisions are going to have a really big impact. We need to be very deliberate about how we engage folks and how those decisions are made and the process by which those decisions are made so that we don't wind up making choices that turn out not to be sustainable down the line. So uh, this slide here is an image from that 2020 framework for the future report. And there's a lot of detail here. Uh, I don't necessarily want to get super bogged down in each of these bullets. Um, you know, some of these are going to happen in sequence, some of them are happening now, some of them are going to happen in a different order. Um, there's two things that I wanted to point out on this slide that I think this graphic helps to illustrate. Thing number one is that little star at the very bottom of the road. That's kind of where we are now. And uh, the point of pointing that out is that we're at the very, very beginning of a very long road. We're really just getting started on this work and there is an enormous amount of work to be done. The other thing that I wanna point out is those orange milestone bullets way off ahead in the development phase. And the reason I wanna point those out is that, you know, it's, it's very natural when we talk about ultra high speed ground transportation uh, it's very natural to want to talk about alignment in stations um, and where those are going to be, because, you know, if if this thing is built, that's how people interact with it. That's those are the things that, you know, most people care most about. That being said, we aren't really in a position yet to have a productive conversation about where exactly the alignment is going to be and where those stations are going to be. And that's because there's some really important building blocks that we need to put in place first. Before we can have that discussion, we need to have built a governance and decision-making framework that is capable of having that discussion and making decisions on behalf of the region, which includes two US states and one Canadian province. And you know that's one of our priorities and we're working on putting that framework together, but we're just not there yet. 
Secondly, and alongside that, uh, we need to have a robust and comprehensive stakeholder engagement approach. Uh, as I was kind of saying earlier, um, when those discussions happen, we need to make sure that they're incorporating the perspectives and the priorities of the communities that will be affected up and down the corridor. Thirdly, and uh, you know, this is a little bit different, but still very important, is a lot, of, a lot has changed since 2020. And that includes some potentially transformative technologies that are in development, such as electric aviation, uh, autonomous vehicles. Those things could change the equation on what ultra high speed ground transportation should look like. And we need to understand what those future scenarios look like before we get too far down this path. And last but not least, uh, we need to have a sustainable funding and financing strategy. Each of those other three things that I've listed are really big lifts. Uh, and so we'll need to make sure that we have the resources to do them in, uh, in a solid way. Uh, so that's you know, kind of where we're at. Um, we believe that there's a really good opportunity right now to make some good headway on, on those items, um, including some kind of big developments in the last year. So uh, to talk about that, I'll hand the virtual floor over to Jason. Um, yeah, back to you, boss. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Um, could you advance the next slide, please? So as you all can see, the foundation that we built over the last few years really sets us up for the current and future work. Um, aside from this project spanning two states and two countries, um, this project is also unique in that we do have the support of the corridor's leadership. So from Premier Horgan, Governor Inslee, as well as Governor Brown in Oregon, um, those leaders have had unwavering support uh, for this project. Uh, this project was initially initiated under a memorandum of understanding, and those uh, agreements have been up to date, uh, have been put up to date uh, since. So our most recent memorandum of understanding for the corridor looks and commits implementation of our project initiation steps. That sends a very strong signal to our legislature and other decision makers as well. Um, the legislature um, not only uh, has funded us for the work to date, but also gives us WashDOT the uh, direction to move forward with the work. Part of that direction is to set up a policy committee. We've gone ahead and done that. And this is intended to be a uh, smaller, uh, smaller group executive level body, really looking to represent a lot of the transportation and planning agencies across the corridor. The goal of the committee is to coordinate and guide, again, this very early project implementation stage. Um, we're also fortunate in that in last year's or this year's uh, legislative session, um, the legislature gave us direction and funding for this project. So $4 million was awarded for us to uh, essentially conduct five tasks. And I'll go through that in the next slide. So $4 million to do that along with that um, legislature provided um, some uh, local match money. 150 million set aside for any federal grant opportunities. Um, and so the legislature has spoken and said, you know, these are the requirements that you will be doing, but also here's some matching funds um, in order for you to be able to take, take those opportunities. Um, again, we're in a good position uh, to move forward with a, a lot of the work that we've done to date the creation of the bipartisan infrastructure law um, also sets us up for uh, additional work down the line. And so if we go to the next slide, I'll talk about that uh, a little bit more. So um, legislature gave us direction to do five tasks. Um, this is a quick summary of those tasks given to uh, the agency. Um, one is to develop an organizational framework. Um, very important in this early planning stage in that you want to align 
um, and coordinate a lot of your um, decision making ability and leadership and agreement development. So having that uh, organizational framework is really going to be important for us to have moving forward. Um, one of the key focus areas of the five tasks is to prepare for and apply for federal funding. Again, the uh, creation of the bipartisan infrastructure law, coupled with the foundation that we built over the last few years with the previous studies, really sets us up for uh, future opportunities. And so applying, preparing for and applying for that federal application is a key focus for us. Um, that is no small feat. Um, there's a lot of information as well as stakeholder engagement and um, collaboration that needs to happen in order to be able to pull an application together. Um, we will continue to work on uh, the funding and financing strategies, as well as look at private contributions as we look forward to putting the uh, federal application together. Um, of course, this can't happen without robust public engagement support. So we're also instructed to develop what that engagement and outreach plan would look like. Um, and we're being very um, uh, strategic about that. We understand that the engagement is very is going to be very different uh, in the Vancouver area, the Seattle area, and or the Portland area. And if you just take uh, the Seattle uh, example for a second, very different set of conversations. If you have conversations with communities and businesses, let's just say downtown Seattle versus Bellevue, Redmond, and maybe the uh, out, outer lying cities uh, of the Seattle metro region. So we really got to make sure that we take a careful strategic approach uh, uh, with our public engagement. So we're, we're going to be building that as we speak. Um, the third uh, task that we have is to begin to build our scenario analysis. Um, it's no surprise that there's also a lot of new technologies coming into uh, the market, um, connected automated transportation, electric aviation. What role do those new advanced technologies play uh, with uh, or in relation to the project that we have. Also the growth. Um, there's a recent study in the region that we have that there's expected to be a net gain of 2 million additional residents. So that increased in growth, how does, how does this project also help address um, growth that's coming, perhaps uh, workforce uh, issues, perhaps uh, housing and affordable housing issues, um, as well as equity issues um, from a lot of our transportation projects. Um, and then lastly, looking at development uh, and recommendation for a coordinating committee. Um, should this project move forward beyond the state that it's at, you will really need a more formal coordinating entity to help guide future work uh, for this program and for this project. So a lot of the work that we're doing, we're preparing for the federal application, preparing for the engagement, looking at the growth and advanced technologies, as well as preparing for governance and uh, stronger coordination for all those uh, impacted along the corridor. Um, and I think this is the last slide, but we may have just one more closing. And I think Chris and Rick, we could go to questions. Um, there's additional information that folks can find uh, on this website. Um, the quotes um, I just went ahead and threw in here um, just to essentially indicate the level of support that, again, uh, we've had for this project. Um, including the, the premier uh, of BC, uh, even President Brad Smith from Microsoft, um, as well as Governor Inslee and Governor Brown. So with that, I encourage you to take a look at our website. Um, there's additional information there. Um, and as we move along in this phase of the project, we will be uh, posting updated information um, via this website. So that's really gonna be a handy website for folks to have. And so with that, I will turn it back over to you, Chris. Great, thank you. I had to unmute there for a second. And uh, 
We have uh, quite a few questions. I did not uh, take you up on your offer to uh, interrupt because I felt that would have been interrupting all the time, but uh, now we've got a good uh, number to choose from. And then um, I lost track of who's sharing, but we should un- I, am, I should unshare? Okay. Let's see if I can figure out how to do that. <laughs> okay. No. So let's, uh, let's start out uh, with, a, with a question from Thomas. Um, what have you learned from other states and countries that are currently building high-speed transportation systems? I think one lesson learned is really the importance of that engagement. Not only is it important to engage the communities impacted by this, but also businesses, right? Um, they could also be a very strong ally uh, for a project like this. So again, um, being methodical in that engagement and the approach that you have, um, I think is one of the lessons learned that, that we've heard from other projects of this nature across the state. And in fact, uh, uh, sorry, across the country, and in fact, across the world. Okay. Great. And uh, here is uh, another one of, you know, sort of from the international realm. Uh, Bob Walsh asks uh, or, or observes first, Europe is using their high-speed rail network to move containerized freight during off-peak hours. Are you considering this for Cascadia? We have looked at that, um, and I would say we continue to look at that. Um, the uh, opportunities for high-speed freight, it's probably not going to be you know, your, your 40 foot containers moving at 250 miles an hour, probably that. So what sort of version of, of freight are you moving at high speeds? Um, it's perhaps parcel, um, those, those parcels five pounds or less. Um, and so we, we, we've, we've looked at that tangentially, kind of poked around the edges a little bit. There's also, um, you know, logistical issues with that. Um, how are you able to, uh, move those parcels uh, uh, on and off the, the, the system once it's built. So there's additional logistical questions that needs to be answered. But, but yes, um, it, it is um, something that we've looked at in the past, but not the focus of the, of the project. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh, and Bob had a follow-up uh, observation and, and question on, on this, um, which was that uh, we've, we've seen the, uh, the adverse uh, impact of delays in rulemaking for other high-speed rail projects. Um, do you, you know, at, this, at the stage that you're at, do you feel that you have the guidance that you need from the you know, FRA to, to do this? Or... Uh, yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And, and I think there are benefits to perhaps coming in second or, or, or third in, in that you know, you're not breaking the plane and, and, and being on the bleeding edge. There's a great quote um, that a former colleague of mine had used in the past, and I love this. Um, the quote goes something like this, that the early bird gets the worm and it's the second mouse that gets the cheese. So I kind of see us as that second mouse, you know, kind of getting ready to take that cheese on. But yeah, I think, um, you know, we do uh, take a look at those uh, lessons learned and learn from others. Um, and, and hopefully that puts us in a better position to date better advantages of these opportunities, such as FRA uh, rulemaking. Okay, great. And uh, uh, Clark observed that your estimates of air travel time seemed not in that one chart seemed not to include time for the airport boarding process. Uh, does that mean that you're operate you're sort of deliberately operating with conservative estimates there? Yeah, no, these are also another great question. Um, and, and it brings up a uh, point that I haven't addressed before. Um, the numbers that folks have seen, um, I need to emphasize that these are very early preliminary high level uh, estimates. Um, and this is based on, I think Adam had mentioned it before, sort of the analysis that we did early in the um, studies where we were looking at um, potential alignments, we were looking at potential stations, um, not to identify them for design or engineering purposes, but to identify what those trade-offs are, right? There, there's a big difference if you're running 250 miles an hour, big difference uh, with that runtime um, with three stations versus nine. So we looked at uh, stations all the way up to nine 
Um, but what we found out was that, you know, the, the more stops you have, the less you're able to take uh, advantage of the high speeds. So again, there's a trade-off. We wanted to understand what those trade-offs are. And some of these numbers that uh, we've shared are based on some of the scenarios and analysis that we've done. But again, these are preliminary, very high level, um, not investment grade uh, uh, numbers uh, uh, by any means. Okay. It, you know, uh, somebody brought up the issue of stops a couple of times in the questions. I think it was John Sharp. Uh, but I, I just have to point out the, there's two high speed lines between Shanghai and Nanjing right now. They're both running at 200 miles an hour, plus or minus. And one of them's got a lot of stops. And boy, is it impressive to be in one of those local stops and you're in the train that's stopping and the other one's passing you by. Um, so uh, it is possible to have locals and expresses and Tokyo to Osaka is another one of those where they've actually got three levels of service. The fastest being two, run, two hours and 20 minutes and the slowest, the slow ones being three hours. Right? So <laughs> it's possible to have a variety of services. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we took, took a look at uh, those different types of services to Rick. Um, you know, do you have a, a express service? If you had a situation where you had more than three stops, uh, can, you, can you do an express service and only serve those uh, stops certain times, uh, perhaps peak times of the day, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So we did play around with it a little bit, just again, to understand, is this, a, a, a project in the system that's really feasible. And like Adam said, um, it was, and we needed additional information. That's why we continue to work on these studies and analyses. Excellent. Great. And as, as Rick said, you did anticipate a number of questions uh, about the you know, number of stops and you know, how do you take advantage of high-speed rail if you're stopping. Um, but uh, anyway, moving on to other questions. Um, Roger in, in Chicago, who is actually uh, a, a volunteer helping us, you know, work toward better rail service to O'Hare Airport asks, uh, is direct access with major airports one of your priorities? Um, that is something that we looked at um, and, and would be happy to um, do additional work. Uh, I know at least in Washington state and in the Puget Sound region, there is efforts underway to look at um, a second uh, major airport, in, again, in the Puget Sound area. So there is a commission looking at where potentially that airport, uh, new airport, second SeaTac airport could be located. And I believe that um, they have landed on um, two potential locations or will be soon, um, but, um, We'll be furthering that work and hopefully landing on one potential location in the uh, upcoming year 2023. So we continue to monitor that um, and continue to look at opportunities. Does that make sense depending on where that second airport is sited? Does that make sense to kind of bring in um, uh, ultra high speed? Okay. And in uh, a related question here from Richard, uh, in, in, addition, in addition to airports, um, have you uh, looked at other key sources of demand and how might that affect how you plan this out? For instance, uh, will downtown to downtown service be a high priority or making connections to uh, transit systems, things like that? Yeah, no, that's another great, great question. D demand, of course, ridership is going to be really important for, for this uh, type of system. You know, let me frame this again a little bit differently. You know, if this project was to move forward, um, I'm probably not going to be writing it, right? It's going to be my, 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 my kids or my family members writing it, right? Um, however, that said, we also have to um, forecast a little bit and, and, and think about what does, what does that uh, mega region economy look like in the Pacific Northwest, perhaps a, a decade or two down the line. That is going to be a very different type of mega region economy that we have now, right? So you're going to have your um, predecessor, uh, your, your, your new Amazon, you're going to have your new Microsoft that 
innov innovative cluster. We're trying to understand that a little bit more now. What are those new economies that are going to be emerging again a, a decade or two down the line and trying to understand what are those workforce uh, needs, what are those transportation needs again of that very uh, different economy that we expect to see in in the uh, in the region. So yes, we're absolutely looking at that. That said, however, we're also seeing some changes right now in the airline and rail space. Um, I'm a big aviation buff. Um, and I, I monitor a lot of what the airlines uh, are currently doing. Um, one change that I recently heard is a change in Star Alliance, where Star Alliance uh, essentially um, has uh, airline members. Um, recently, Star Alliance included Deutsche Bahn as part of the alliance. So you're now beginning to see uh, an alliance or network that includes uh, airlines as well as rail. Is that going to apply to uh, the US um, or uh, our rail network here? We don't know, but that's a good, that's a very interesting change in how, you know, that interplay between uh, airlines and rail is happening. So we are looking at that. What are the potential uh, demands, induced demand that comes from changes such as that? Great. And uh, a, a few questions seem to be getting at similar things with, so I'll try to group them together. There seems to be, or there is a lot of interest in the existing cascade service. Uh, are, you, are you looking at the costs and benefits or completion times for building uh, all new high-speed track compared to upgrading or electrifying the existing cas cascades route or upgrading to you know, a cell style service? Yeah, so the, the Cascade service, um, like I said, really important to an ultra high speed rail uh, type of system, right? Um, that, that Cascade's inner city passenger rail is not going to be going away. Um, one of the recent developments on the federal side of things is um, the federal government just rolled out um, uh, corridor identification and development program. Um, the very first step uh, was that they had asked states to submit an expression of interest. Do you want to participate in this federal program? And so what we said was, yes, we absolutely do. And when we submitted our expression of interest that was uh, signed by both Washington and Oregon, as well as uh, with the letter of support from the province of BC. But what we said in that expression of interest was that um, we, we are submitting uh, uh, our interest on behalf of our ultra high speed ground transportation project and Amtrak Cascades, because we believe again, if you move forward and build this project, you have to have that backbone service. You have to have modal connectivity. You have to make sure that you continue to improve on that inner city passenger rail service. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, let's see, uh, we have a couple of questions on timing, and I, I know that at this stage it might not be possible to answer these questions, but um, uh, if you, uh, Andreas asks, if you had to take a guess uh, as, when, as to when we could see an alignment or completion, when do you think something like that could be a possibility? <laughs> yeah, um, I don't have an answer. Um, but if uh, I'll, I'll say it this way, if, if you're to ask me if we were successful in receiving federal funding, what would we do with that? I would say that federal funding would support development of service development plans for the ultra high speed uh, system, um, but also get us closer to some more of the technical analysis. Again, I mentioned early on, needing uh, to whittle down your technology options. We may need to do that as part of that more technical robust analysis. Um, we'll also need to begin to uh, um, look at our uh, NEPA work. Um, and so that too will take a fair amount of technical analysis, coordination, communication, and engagement. So I think you know that will help inform the timeline um, but right now, I, I don't have an answer for that. So these next steps, I'm hoping to, to get through to help us identify what exactly that timeline is going to look like. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Well, and, and with that caveat, um, I hope it's still okay to ask this timing related question. Um, I guess it's more about priorities than, than timing or at least partly. Um, is it a priority to for this project to contribute to meeting the climate goals set by Washington State for 2030, 2040, and 2050? Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it is. And, and I think, you know, um, it, it'll have to, right? I think that that's an expectation, not just of the many communities that um, uh, lie in the quarter, but also many of our decision makers um, all the way to uh, 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 federal administrations, right? So I think it will have to. Um, we did show some early uh, GHG emissions benefit but again, that is very high level and preliminary. That number is more than likely going to change. And it'll change depending on your routing and alignment, your stations, the technology that you select. So again, um, that number was based on you know, our initial feasibility work. Um, but yeah, that number is going to change. Um, we would look at uh, maximizing our emissions reduction as much as possible, uh, perhaps even getting to a net zero, um, if that's even possible with this type of system. So additional work um, and additional conversations on that. Uh, we have uh, one or two questions about the uh, the private freight railroads, uh, and and what are the what are the positions of railroads like the BNSF and Union Pacific on on this program or this effort? Um, I I think they're supportive. You know, um, again, we look at this system as um, symbiotic with our inner city passenger rail system, as many folks know our inner city service runs on freight owned lines. And so, you know, um, like we submitted in the expression of interest, we believe that we need to move forward uh, development of the corridor, not just for all tri-speed, but also for our um, Amtrak Cascades inner city passenger rail system. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, let's see, a new topic. Um, Richard asks, you know, as, as you pointed out, uh, Jason and Adam, you know, this will be an international project. Do you foresee complications due to border crossings that might cause delays? Um, perhaps um, with the, uh, I'm glad to hear that there's a lot of positive movement right now with regards to pre-clearance. Um, but for this project, we are assuming that um, we would have a more seamless uh, international border crossing by the time this project is built. Um, so we're just kind of holding that off to the side, uh, having that assumption, and really won't know until we, we get through some more of the technical analysis work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, here's a, a question about funding um, and you know who might pay for what I guess um, or help to pay for what uh, Clark asks with with 80 percent of the right-of-way structures in Washington state how do you plan to allocate costs among the three entities yeah that's a good question um, frankly we haven't had uh, any meaningful conversation around that um, one way to look at uh, cost breakdown is of course you know who has the bulk of the rail miles that's one way to look at that, absolutely. One way to look at it is who gets to benefit? Is it also Washington that gets to benefit 80% of the service? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but there are different ways to kind of look at who pays and who benefits from that. We haven't had those conversations. Okay. Um, Mary asks, uh, can you give us uh, a more of a sense of the realities involved in creating a new corridor, uh, such as acquisition of new land for one, building an environmentally uh, sensitive, building in environmentally sensitive terrain with earthquake possibilities and, and things like that? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, Adam mentioned this in the beginning when he showed the uh, image. Uh, showing sort of the steps and that linear uh, timeline that we had. 
this is going to be a very big undertaking um, should it move forward. There's a lot of complexities and challenges, of course. Part of that is going through environmentally sensitive habitat. Um, but again, this is where, you know, should we be successful in any federal application and, and, and grant awards that we do need to do that technical analysis. Um, and, and a lot of that information, perhaps a lot of the answers to the questions being raised here today, I think that that technical analysis would be informed by that. Um, we're just not there yet. Um, you know, I think part of the Part of the reason why we're being deliberate in this work, not rushing to that technical analysis and engineering is we really need the corridor to understand why we're doing this, why this is important. So we're taking the time to answer the why questions, the what questions are gonna be coming, right? Um, but it's really important for us to spend the time and answer why this is important, why this region needs this type of project. Okay. And um, will you be seeking expertise from other countries like China uh, or you know others that have a lot of high-speed rail experience? Uh, especially, you know, this uh, this kind of picks up on what the other question asked about um, the possibility of earthquakes. You know, especially experience building uh, through seismically active areas. Absolutely. Um, we want to learn as much as possible from those projects uh, across the world. Um, resiliency, transportation resiliency is one of the things that we are also look, looking at for this project. So if there are lessons learned, best practices that other projects uh, have made around this particular topic, uh, we would love to, to understand uh, that better. Um, for most of the projects that we've conducted, we have looked at many of the international models. Again, around the idea of, you know, what are those best practices and lessons learned? I feel like we have a very good uh, understanding for what some of the best practices and lessons learned are from the other projects, but there's also new projects coming online um, uh, regularly. So we continue to be informed, we continue to learn from these other projects. Okay. And uh, Breck asks, um, how, do you know how many have a, or know or have a sense yet of how many acres of new land might be required for new rights of way across the state? Uh, and then maybe a sense of how much uh, you might be able to share rights of way with the, uh, with the existing railroads? Um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, just because we haven't done that analysis. Right, okay. Um, here's, uh, you know, I know this is, uh, there, there's so many questions uh, that, you know, it just may not be possible to answer at this stage, but uh, there's, there's interest uh, from one uh, commenter about a link across Puget Sound. Uh, any, uh, any comments on that? <laughs> Um, again, looking at the trade-offs um, and looking at that, you know, technical analysis, that does it make sense um, to, to cross a big body of water? Um, you know, I, I should also mention, we did take a look at what are the trade-offs for crossing major water bodies in the sense that when we were conducting the feasibility analysis, does it make sense um, to bring the, uh, uh, service all the way to downtown Portland? Um, does it make sense to bring the service all the way down to downtown Vancouver? Um, there are opportunities there. Uh, one, one example is uh, increased ridership and greater access to the system, but there's also cost with that. You're crossing uh, major water bodies on the Columbia in the Fraser River, right? So there are potentially savings if you don't bring it all the way to those downtown locations. But again, the trade-off, right? You gotta look at those trade-offs. So again, we played around with that a little bit just to kind of see, does it make um, financial sense to look at some of these other options? Um, but, um, you know, again, additional analysis is needed. Okay. Um, David, another one of our technical experts uh, in the Chicago area asks, um, will having both local and express service be considered? I, I think, you know, as, as we look at the technologies and begin to whittle that down, um, as well as service options, we, we would want to take a look, uh, look at that. 
one of the other um, uh, feasibility analysis uh, we, we conducted was a blended service. So blended service meaning, can you build dedicated track for the high speed line, but bring it into the existing stations um, to kind of save on cost, but also to take advantage of those existing locations that we currently have. So that express service and or the ability to bring the, the service into existing stations and locations, that is also something that we looked at as part of that feasibility analysis. So. TBD still on that one. Okay. Uh, we have a, a question from someone in the industry. Uh, Ken asks, what work scope are you currently doing? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Ken. Um, again, we are focused on the five uh, tasks and requirements, partly because it's the um, direction from the legislature. So we're doing good on that. Um, our priority, as I mentioned before, is uh, preparing for and applying for those federal funding opportunities. Um, so we're going to be focused on that over the next, I think, takes us through 20, uh, mid-2023. Um, and at the same time, we will be working on developing the strategies and the implementation plan for those other tasks that I mentioned. Okay, we're getting close to the top of the hour, so we should probably just take a couple more. Um, if that's okay. Um, uh, here's one: uh, the the Pacific Northwest has the headquarters of some of the country's biggest and most well-known companies. You already uh, showed us a quote from uh, someone at Microsoft. Have other uh, major employers in the area expressed support for this project? Um, I would say, yeah, part of our um, work. Um, in the in the current scope is going out and doing interviews, interviews to help identify, you know, for for many of the communities as well as the um, businesses, what is the expectation for a project like this? Uh, well, what are the what are the um, goals and or objectives for a, 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 an organization like Microsoft or Amazon? Right, so we're continuing to engage many of these businesses um, and we're doing so through our current work with um, surveys and interviews. Okay, and um, William asked, uh, is, what about uh, educational institutions? Is there an association or body of higher educational institutions that are involved at this point? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think if, you, if you're looking at a system like this, um, the, the uh, economic benefit is not just huge and monumental. The, the ability for this to impact academia and, and uh, training um, is also uh, uh, enormous. So we're not quite there yet, um, but yes, uh, in the back of my mind, I've been thinking about how do you engage, um, you know, your your university educational institutions, because I think they do have a strong role to play um, uh, by way of education, by way of training, um, should this um, project become a, a come to fruition. Right. Well, uh, why don't we wrap it up for the questions? Um, there's, you know, anyone who's been watching, you know, knows that there's been a, a lively discussion going on in the chat as well. People sharing their email addresses uh, to keep it going, which is great. Uh, we will, as always, uh, we'll post a recording of this uh, on our website uh, sometime next week, probably. And our speakers have also offered to make their slides available as well for those who would like them. So please email us if you're interested in those. Um, thank you all. Um, Rick, any uh, concluding thoughts or anyone any concluding thoughts? Oh, Rick, uh, could you unmute? I want to thank you guys so much for doing this presentation. And I uh, really appreciate the discussion of the process that has to happen. Um, you know, in California, I had to go through a similar process where they first did a feasibility study, then they had a commission, and then they created the authority. Um, and this one's a little bit more, comp well, so substantially more complicated because of the state and, and international issues. But really excited that the project's moving forward, and, and thank you for explaining where you're at. And uh, we look forward to helping folks in Washington 
uh, move this project forward, get additional frequencies on the cascades, um, and then also, you know, work um, with, uh, you know, the, the small detail question before we go. What about Spokane or Spokane? I'm not sure how you pronounce it. <laughs> how does that fit into this big picture? Well, I, I will say that um, Amtrak is just undertaking a new long distance study. So I think we'll want to wait until the results of that come out before we could have a better understanding of how this feeds into the ultra high speed work. Excellent. And I will, that's a, a segue. Um, as we learn more about what's happening with that study, we will have uh, a webinar on how people can get engaged and start talking about adding frequencies and taking times out of the, what I would prefer to call them interregional trains. But uh, again, thank you so much for this. This is very helpful um, in understanding the process and, and where you're at. And we really appreciate uh, you being here today. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all.